history of palliative care that stems largely from an adult population and actually grew out of a hospice mo movement really in the 70s or 80s. So people Google it and then often get nervous, and like Patty said, that it's gonna be all about sort of doom and gloom and end of life, and it's really not, um, and especially it's not in pediatrics. So some families, when they get referred to me, they kind of go online, they look it up, they get scared, and then they don't come. And maybe it'll take a few months of their primary referring doctor to kind of nudge him a little and say, you know, go see Dr. Moody, she's not gonna be too scary. And, and then when they come and sit with me, they have so much relief after our visit, um, and they'll tell me, quite frankly, I was really afraid to come today. I was afraid what you were gonna say, I was afraid of what you were gonna do, she said, but now I just feel so much better. So, so don't be afraid of your palliative care doctor. Um, so I put this up, this is actually from a friend of mine at Nemours. Um, we might call that palliophobia. Um, and then she had this sort of, he's our new palliative care specialist as the Grim Reaper. So some people have this sort of connotation in their mind that this can be really kind of dark and gloomy, but it, it doesn't have to be. Um, so the foundations, truthfully, in palliative care are not so different than what I would say they are in medicine, but palliative care has evolved from a need to really um, kind of harness these foundations in medicine and make sure that they're being um, promoted all through medicine. And that's really a family and patient-centered approach to care. So making sure that the patient's really front and center and the family's needs are being heard and met. And that it's not just kind of a one-way agenda of what the doctors feel like they need to do for the patients, but also what the patients are seeing as what they need from the doctors. Um, and it's always given as an interdisciplinary team. So there's never a palliative care doctor that's sort of working in isolation. There's a nurse, there's a doctor, and there's a social worker, usually at a minimum. And then we usually also work with psychologists, child life specialists, including art and music therapy. And then my team also uses integrative medicine, which not all teams have that, but more and more teams are having that. And what that means is that it's a provider that maybe brings some alternative things in, such as massage, or yoga, or mind-body techniques, things that help people feel better. Um, so really thinking outside the box to make sure that symptoms are managed and that quality of life is optimized. Um, another piece of our program it often includes a chaplain for helpful help with spiritual support um, as well as a pharmacist because sometimes um, when we're working with medications we like to minimize toxicities and things like that so we make special formulations for people including topical formulations or very concentrated formulations for people that can only take a small volume and those things have to be done through a specialty pharmacy um, the other kind of foundation of palliative care is that the care is provided across settings, meaning that the babies are seen in the newborn ICU, they're seen in the clinics, they're seen at home, they're seen when they come back, if they come back and they get sick and they go to the hospital, and so the care could be provided even um, in an institution, really anywhere. So that's kind of the other pieces. We tell families, we'll follow you sort of wherever your child is. And then um, care coordination. So. That piece of palliative care really just means that we make sure that all the um, kind of moving parts of the physician teams are working in, in unison and always have the family's needs kind of front and center of their care plan. And it, that may seem like something that wouldn't be a necessary thing for a physician to do, but unfortunately our care gets very fragmented, and especially when you have a child that has issues with more than one symptom. So they have maybe a pulmonologist, and they have a neurologist, and they have an orthopedic surgeon. One of the things that parents get concerned about is, are all these doctors talking to each other? You know, one makes a medication recommendation, or one makes a recommendation for X, and the other makes a recommendation for Y, and how do we know that everybody's really talking to each other? And that can be challenging to expect of all the physicians, and so one thing that we do as a team is make sure that those conversations are happening, even if I'm doing it myself. Um, and very often they are, but sometimes they're not, and sometimes you may have a specialist in another state that you're seeing, and then that's even harder to coordinate because you know, up-to-date information may not be readily available to all the providers. So this is something that we provide as a helpful physician to help with that communication, that crosstalk between the other services. And then it's a continu to, uh, continuum of care, meaning we start at the beginning and we'll follow pretty much forever until you age out. So if you um, are being transferred to an adult hospital and you're no longer in a children's hospital, then we stop following you, but we can certainly follow you throughout. And, um, and for some kids, we follow them for their whole life, so it just depends. 
So the focus is to improve quality of life of patients and families, so uh, facing problems associated with life-threatening or life-limiting illness. Um, and I put families in underline because I wanted to sort of point out that we really do look at, you know, how are the siblings being affected, um, how are the parents being affected, how are the grandparents being affected, how is the primary care provider of managing, because obviously it's a big job for whoever that person is, it's often a mom or dad, and you know, how are they holding up, and who are they leaning on, and who takes care of them, and what if they don't feel well, then what happens? Um, who kind of picks up the slack for that family, and how can we make sure that they are most plugged in and most resourced, so that there's always a, a plan in place. Um, and then the other thing that we really focus on is to prevent and relieve suffering through early identification and assessment of symptoms physical, psychosocial, spiritual, just symptoms in general. So kind of what's troubling you, what's bothering you. And very often what is bothering a child or bothering the family is different than what the physician may walk in and think what's bothering the child and the family. Um, I hope you can see this. So this is sort of a uh, kind of classic palliative care slide by Betty Farrell, who is a palliative care nurse, of the sort of four domains we talk about in palliative care. So the first one is physical. So these are functional abilities and activities of daily living. You know, how are those being done? How are those being optimized? Are we doing the best we can to give this child the most function that they can have? Um, how is their fatigue and, how, and their energy levels? Um, are they getting good sleep at night? Are they breathing comfortably? Are they feeding comfortably? How is their appetite? Do they get constipated? Do they have pain? So some of those basic physical symptoms. And surprisingly, this short list is not necessarily the list that the other doctors are uh, asking when they see you. So we kind of have our own little list of symptoms that we address. And then psychological issues, so anxiety. If any chronic illness, there's always some risk of anxiety and depression just because it's hard to live with a chronic illness. Um, and so, and the, we want to always screen for those things. Is their child finding enjoyment? Are we making sure that we're um, having the best possible access to the things the child loves to do? Um, is there distress from the discomfort? So if there is any discomfort associated with the treatment or the disease itself, what kind of just psychological distress is that causing? Because there's sort of a like pain and symptom piece, and then there's the, the psychological suffering that goes with that. Um, and this sort of happiness, fear, and then cognition, and then attention, and school, and things like that. Um, social issues like appearance or um, roles and relationships. I mentioned caregiver burden already, financial burdens, um, children being concerned about their own appearances, and then uh, particularly information preferences. So what do families want to know? What do children want to know? Are we tailoring our care to what their needs are? Um, do they like to receive information when they have maybe two or three people with them so that they can have people to talk to about it when they leave or someone to kind of check what say, is that what you said? Because it's going to be very hard and complicated. So assessing that upfront is helpful. Um, and decision making, how are the medical decisions made? Are they all following in one person? Are they usually done as a family discussion? And I think on our part, knowing those things helps us to make care plans as we go along. Um, and then spiritual issues, kind of what is the meaning of all of this? Um, where is our religiosity in this? And how, is, how has that been affected? by having this illness. Um, and what does it mean to have be suffering, or what are we hoping for? Um, what are we expecting, and things like that? And are we in a period of acceptance with what's happening? Um, so there's some spiritual stuff. I wanted to also show this. This is the concept of total pain. So pain is an interesting kind of word and phenomenon. People sometimes might use pain to sort of you know, signify a headache or a, a stubbed toe. But, but pain and total, the concept of total pain is that pain can be a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And it's important to unpack it. You know, when someone comes complaining of a pain, it's important to know not only just what is the physical maybe cause or, of that pain, but what are the other pieces that might be contributing to the pain? How else is this person suffering? Um, so I just, I kind of like this slide because it kind of speaks to that. I've had a lot of patients, like adolescents in particular, express to me sometimes very imaginative reasons for why they're suffering. Um, and it's really important to sort of unpack, unpack that a little bit. People take on a lot psychologically um, when they're burdened with a chronic illness. It's sort of like an explanation as to maybe why it's happening. And it's really important sometimes to really um, understand what's going on in that patient's mind. So feel free to ask any questions as I go. I'm a little quiet. So I know I talk quickly, so you may feel like you have no opportunity to jump in, but please, <laughs> you can. In, in any state, you said? Is it, is it nationwide? So that's a really good question. About about 68% or so of children's hospitals now have a palliative care program. So about a little less than a third are 
still not really where they probably need to be with palliative care. It's, it's a field that's new. Um, in pediatrics, it's probably only about 15 years old. Um, and it, so it really even less. Conceptually, it kind of came out about 15 years ago, but then in practice, it started growing probably in the last five to 10 years. And there's about 10 training programs now in the country for new doctors to learn palliative care. Um, but you should definitely inquire at your institution. Um, and there may or may not be somebody there. And I would caution you a little bit about seeing adult providers that do palliative care, because I think the pediatric specialty is different. Um, so they, can, they may be helpful, but maybe, but maybe not. So it's hard to know. Um, so the World Health Organization made a definition of palliative care for children. Um, it requires a group of caregivers that includes the family. So there's really an understanding that the family are sort of key, right, and central to the decisions and the care for the patient. Um, and then even when, when there are limited resources available in the community or otherwise, we can sort of piecemeal things. So I don't actually have a social worker right now on my team, though I will in a month, but we will utilize an available social worker from other services as needed and things like that. So we, we make it work. Um, and it can be provided, as I mentioned before, pretty much any place. Community centers, patients' homes, hospitals, wherever the patient needs it to be done. Um, so what is it not? It's definitely not giving up. It's not stopping any medical treatments that are aimed at helping or curing a disease. It's not withholding care. It's not withdrawing care. It's not hospice. You guys have heard of hospice? It's not hospice. It's not certainly not a one-size-fits-all. Every uh, patient is viewed as an individual as, and the family, and, and treatment is tailored to that family's needs, values, desires, hopes, wishes, etc. Um, it's certainly not just for cancer patients. Um, and we never take over from the primary team. So, you know, there are cases in which for certain families that are facing end of life with their child, it, it's a little bit of a different scenario, and I'll talk briefly about that. But in general, we are a supporting audience. We are an extra layer of support. We are an extra team to have on your, in your corner. Um, but we don't take over from the primary service. We assist families with provision of timely and accurate information. So <clears throat> what we'll sometimes do in the first visit is just sort of say, hey, tell me what you understand about your disease, and then I can sort of check anything that if you have questions with specific providers about specific things and you haven't had a chance to ask me one, I can certainly check for you and see what I can find out. Um, we help you assimilate the information. Sometimes when you are getting hit with information from especially multiple body systems, it's very hard to put it all together and say, okay, so what does this mean for my kid? In the big picture, what does this mean for my child? And so we are a good team to kind of help with that. Um, we like to engage family in discussions about decision making. So sometimes you're faced with decisions about surgeries or, or interventions and you need to know what to do, when to do it, what's the optimal timing, should we do it, is this too much, is this dangerous? And again, we're another team that can help you kind of weigh benefits and burdens, risks, and et cetera, of different interventions. And we like to make sure that the care plan stays consistent with your goals. I mean, your child may have a really big, important trip coming up, but the orthopedic surgeon is the only time they can do their scoliosis surgery. And then we may have to kind of give them a call and say, you know, this is really important to this family. Can you just maybe move some things around? And that's sometimes a hard thing for families to advocate for themselves, but one thing that we really keep track of them, again, is quality of life, like making sure that all along the way of this um, life's journey, that it's not just about the procedures and the medical interventions, it's about life, and it's about enjoying life. Um, and a quarterback, so what family once said that to us is it's kind of like having a quarterback, somebody to kind of go, wait a minute, this family needs this, someone just to kind of direct a little bit, kind of the care process. So this is kind of a nice little diagram from the literature that, that talks about palliative care. So we're sort of here, and so we can kind of help with some problem solving and decision making. Um, and we do that by knowing what are you hoping for, what are your goals, what's the issue that you're facing, and what are the options that we have. And then we may do our interventions with patients, with family, with staff. Sometimes we just meet with staff. Sometimes we, that's where, where the need is. Sometimes we're just meeting with extended family. Um, it varies. You know, what kind of support does a family have? Are they getting everything that they need? Can we provide more for them? And then what a sort of oh, body-mind. This is another big piece. A lot of times the sort of mind piece of what's happening to the patient and family is getting neglected in all of the physical issues. So making sure that someone's paying attention to how you're feeling about all this. You know, where are you emotionally and psychologically? And then logistically, can, do you need more services at home? Do you need more coordination of your care? Are you, is your insurance covering what you needed to cover? Um, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily fix all of these things, but we try to direct it to the right resources that can. Okay, 
So just so some people, if you've been familiar with palliative care, in the past palliative care is very much associated with hospice and care at the end of life. And that's really changed dramatically over the past uh, two decades. And now palliative care is thought to start really a diagnosis to help the person with the illness with symptoms, to support families and caregivers. And as disease progresses or things change along the way, palliative care may take on a larger role depending on how symptomatic the patient becomes. So, the, so kind of looking at this diagram, it's sort of like palliative care can get larger in terms of their role or it can stay small. It depends where the patient is. So what does this mean for Palaisia Smersbacker patients? Well, they present very variably, as you probably know, and some patients present with a form of the disease that might very dramatically shorten their lifespan um, into the second decade, or versus a classic form where patients could live into their 70s. So it, it really varies, and it's important for us to know kind of what's the expectation there, and that even though nobody is a statistic, it's helpful to get us a little bit of a sense of what to expect. And then how do you adjust, oops, Go back. How to adjust to illness, so the new normal. So certain things might happen along the way. At some point, maybe somebody needs a tracheostomy, a little tube that might go here to help breathe, or a feeding tube because swallowing has become troublesome. So how do you adjust to that? Now that's our new normal, right? What does that look like for us? How is that going to make my child feel? Um, we're a team that gets involved very often if there's changes. Um, how do we optimize quality of life at every stage of illness? Um, especially, again, when there's multi-system functional issues like feeding, or swallowing, or breathing, or movement, how do we sort of coordinate to make sure that all these systems are optimally functioning together? And again, keeping our eyes on the prize. What does your child get to do that's fun? What do they love to do? What do you get to do that's fun? Are you getting to do those things? So symptom optimization, maximize quality of life, and function. Um, again, I mentioned patients front and center. So some of the things we might ask is, what are the most important things in your life? so that we're really kind of getting, at, getting to know you, getting to know what's important to you and your family. What are you hoping for? What are the values that drive your priorities and choices in your care? Um, what gives your life meaning? And that's really important for the children. You know, what, what is the most meaningful things for them? What are the important relationships? And are we making sure that they're sticking with their peers and they're getting appropriate development and social, social um, interactions? Um, who's the social support? And this is important not just for the patient, but for the family, and especially for that caregiver who's doing, you know, probably 24-7 in charge of everything, uh, care for their child. What happens for that person? Who does that person get to lean on? Um, what do we want to accomplish? What are our desires and our goals for, for ourselves and for our lives? And what do we want to leave behind? So when, what goals of care, so goals of care are kind of a term that's used in medicine to help um, defined kind of drivers of choices. So when values and priorities are identified, it becomes a bit easier to weigh some of the benefits and burdens of different interventions and procedures, um, especially when it comes to things like eating and breathing. And I point this out because, so we've had some families come to us that might say that, well, you know, we have a little bit of issues with eating, um, where maybe they're getting a little bit of coughing intermittently, but boy, my kid really loves to have those blue lollipops and my doctor won't let us have them. And so trying to work out what is the best sort of compromise to sort of optimize quality of life for that child but not put them in too much risk. And so this is what we look at, kind of values, priorities, and the medical picture to help kind of figure that all out. Uh, same thing happens sometimes with tracheostomy tubes. I have some families, you guys familiar with what that is? We have some families that don't, they want to put that off as long as they can, um, and that's okay. You know, can we get, get through with other measures in the meantime? What can we do? And maybe we take some risk if we're going to have some benefit um, to not doing that. So it, it's, it's okay to kind of weigh out your choices. Very often you may walk into a doctor's office, get a recommendation, and sort of feel obligated. And we like to be there to be able to discuss with you that you have time. You have time to process some of this information. You have time to think about this. You have time to really um, try to determine for yourself and your family what this means for you. Uh, so we're there to support you. We're there to support the family and the patient as they navigate these really difficult decisions. So how do you know if you might benefit from a palliative care consult? Well, if the patient's experiencing any stepwise declines in health, so you know this kind of thing, like you're like, trucking along okay, but then boom, something happens, you might get in bed pneumonia, there's a new issue, new complication, and now we're kind of here. And then boom, we might get some other hit. So if there's a stepwise decline, then I think it's helpful to ha help us to reframe that sort of new normal as I talked about. Um, or what about if symptoms just aren't well managed? So, despite kind of best efforts on everyone's part, my child is still suffering. 
you know, something's still not right, he's not happy, or he's just struggling with a symptom, then that's really an indicator that maybe we can help. Or care feels disjointed. Are my doctors really talking to each other? I feel like, you know, the left hand and the right hand aren't working together. I went to the hospital and no one seemed to know, you know, my other doctor didn't seem to know why I was there. So that's another indication that we could help. And then a pattern of recurrent hospitalizations with perhaps increased frequency. So if the child is coming in and out, in and out, and I don't mean for procedures, but I mean for sick visits, then sometimes it's worthwhile to talk to us a little bit about what are your options for care at home. You know, can we provide more help in the home so that you're not always coming back and forth to the hospital? And especially if A, the hospital's not close, or you have other children, or your child doesn't like the hospital at all, it makes them really unhappy, that's a really important thing to think about. So what about when life is shortened? And this, we talked a little about this last year, and I think it was hard for folks to hear about this part of the talk, but. And I apologize about for that. But I think it's important to just talk a little bit about this because there's some really good information I can give you, and I want you to have it if you if you may face this in the future. Um, we are a team that can help discuss some fears and worries with the child. Um, and, and again, every child's different, and some child some children don't want to discuss anything, but some children do. Um, and we alleviate some time and communication from the primary team by discussing some of these difficult subjects. And again, not just with the kids, but also with the parents and the siblings. So we're kind of there for them too. You know, maybe some children have wondered about something and we want to kind of get at what they're thinking about. I'll ask kids what they're afraid of, if they want to know about their disease, if they have questions. We don't give any more information than they want to receive. And I think that's really critical. And I think that's true too of parents sort of in general. So this is a big room, so I just kind of have to give you information that I have. But one-on-one, -on -one, we really get at it by, do you want to talk about this? Is this something I can share with you? Are you comfortable with this conversation? Should we put this on hold for another time? We are definitely not in the business of forcing information to anybody that's not ready to really talk about it. Um, but if they are, we like to talk about memory making, especially with kids and families, existential issues and closure, and then legacy making. So what does this child want to leave behind? I had a 15-year-old recently tell me, I want the world to hear my music. And when they came to see me, they, again, you know, it was one of these things where they weren't sure what to expect to come see me, and I looked at him and I said, what do you love to do? What's most important to you? And he said, I love to make music. I said, are you getting to do it? He said, no. I said, well, then that's what we gotta do. And I said, well, you know, tell me more about that. He said, I want the world to hear my music when I'm done. And that's what he's doing. And I feel like it was a really big deal for us to get that information from him. And he said to me, I feel so much better that I came to see you because now I feel like I really can get that done. And I think he'd been maybe been afraid to talk to bring that up to his family. So I said before that palliative care is not hospice. So, but I want to tell you a little bit about what hospice is because it's different for pediatrics, um, and I think it's important to understand that. So, as I mentioned, palliative care again integrated at any time. It's a continuum of care. We have a lot of patients that survive well into adulthood, as you know, with your um, cohorts of disease that um, so many live into their 70s, normal lifespans. It's a continuum. It's care across settings, right? Hospice is really for patients who are suspected to be nearing the end of their life. So it's a very specific care, and we still take care of those patients, so that's part of palliative care, it's just not what palliative care is. And so, it's, hospice is really a, a type of care, it's not a place, um, it's really an insurance benefit, it's a type of care that's interdisciplinary, so it, again, it's, it's, there's a continuum on the palliative care model. Um, it generally takes place at home. It includes 24-7 on-call nursing visits to evaluate and treat. This is really critical for patients who live far from medical centers who may need help in, within 15 minutes for a symptom or a problem and they want somebody there. They bring med refills to your doorstep. They provide respite, so five or seven days of just total coverage for your child every month. Um, and then they provide continuous care, so that's a nurse 24-7 if you need it. And then they have a 13-month follow-up. So, they, it's a basically just a type of care. And then I wanted to point out what's different between adult and pediatric. There's actually a federal mandate that says that children do not have to forgo any other services to which the child is entitled for treatment of the medical condition. Hospice care is provided concurrently with all medically necessary curative treatments. So this is really important. This is a major difference between adult and pediatric because in adults this is not true. And in pediatrics, it is a federal mandate. Now, it doesn't mean I have to fight with the insurance company is a big chunk of my time, but we get it. We get everything that we need for the kids. Is your nursing hours, you're not. Um, you can't go to the hospital, you can. You can't call an ambulance, you can. You can't have surgery, you can. There is nothing that you are limited to when you're a pediatric patient if you accept hospice, okay? So that's just an important distinction, and that's why I wanted to mention it. Okay, so in summary, um, palliative care should feel like a safety net. It should not feel scary, it should feel safe. They should feel supportive. 
Um, some people actually refer to palliative care in the medical world as an additional layer of support. It always exists as an interdisciplinary team and works alongside your primary team. It helps with care coordination and aims to provide relief from pain and suffering and to optimize quality of life. Okay. Yeah, that's all I got. Thank you.